Welcome to, to today's webinar, Advanced Features of SEP Distributed Storage System. I'm Danielle Womble, Director of Marketing at Ink Tank, your moderator and webinar organizer. Before we start, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is familiar with the webinar control panel. The top of the slide panel, you will find five buttons. These buttons can be used to ask a question, answer voting questions, view attachments with additional related material, and also allows you to rate the webinar and leave us feedback. Please feel free at any time during the webinar to ask questions and to leave feedback as these are important to us. I will also like to note that today's webinar will be recorded for future playback. Thank you for joining the final webinar of the webinar series that we have ran over the last month. Today's webinar will feature Sage Ryle, creator of Seth and founder and CTO at Ink Tank. Sage will focus on advanced features and configuration of Seth as well as the Seth roadmap. Now I'd like to turn it over to Sage. Hi, thanks Danielle. Hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about, um, well this is a similar talk to what I usually give at conferences actually, so it's going to talk a little bit about the Ceph architecture, how it's built, how it's put together, um, and some of the more interesting things you can do with the system. Um, a bit of back, um, a bit of an outline about what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start by giving a little bit of motivation about why you should care about another distributed storage system. Um, at a high level, what stuff is for and what it's good for. Um, I'll talk about how it works, how the architecture is put together, and then the various ways that you can consume this sort of generic storage platform um, via object APIs or block APIs or file APIs. Um, I'll end up um, with a little bit of discussion about the current roadmap, what releases are out there, and where we're going. Um, and then I'll finish up at the end. So I'm going to start with just um, a little bit of background. Um, Ink Tank is a company that we've um, recently founded that provides professional services and support for SEFs. Um, it was founded last year, um, actually at the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. Um, initially funded by DreamHost, um, a web hosting company that has invested heavily in SEF technology. Um, we've taken some funding from DreamHost, also from Mark Shuttleworth um, of Canonical Ubuntu fame. Um, and I'm sort of the founder CTO person for Ink Tank. Um, Ceph is an open source project. It's a distributed unified object block and file storage platform. Um, it's open source. Um, there are clients in Linux kernel and um, we're working very hard to make sure it's well integrated with various cloud um, platforms like OpenStack and CloudStack. Um, and others like Kennedy and so forth. Um, so just, yeah, Seth is the project, it's the open source project, Ink Tank is the company that, that supports that effort. Um, so at a high level, um, the question that should be on your minds is why you should care about another, another storage system. Um, and there are several reasons. Um, the first is that people have um, a wide range of requirements, and those requirements tend to be changing. So people have diverse storage needs, um, particularly sort of in this new cloud big data um, reality. Um, some people need object storage because they're building large web applications and they just have large amounts of data they need to sort of shovel into a storage system. Um, other people need block devices, um, usually pre presented to virtual machines because they're building some sort of public or private cloud infrastructure. Um, and they need advanced features like snapshots and cloning. Um, some people need a traditional POSIX file system with files and directories, um, but they need it to be accessible from many hosts and it needs to be, you know, petabyte scale and so forth. Um, and other people have sort of this structured or unstructured data problem where they have all this log data or they have all this data that they need to analyze and frankly it's not really clear whether they should be storing that data in files or block devices or objects. Um, and so they're all sort of a wide range of requirements that are being placed on the storage administrator. Um, but perhaps more significantly, people, um, there are increasing demands for scale. So initially systems will be deployed that are terabytes in size, but pretty soon they grow to petabytes, possibly even exabytes. Um, as a result of that scale, they tend to be built with heterogeneous hardware because very few organizations can afford to buy sort of a homogenous environment and deploy it all at once. Um, and because they're very large, reliability and fault tolerance become critical because in these large systems, some components are always going to fail. Um, Similarly, there are additional requirements placed on the administrator. Um, you have these very large systems and you typically have a very small staff that's required to run them. Um, and so things like ease of administration um, become in 
extremely important. Um, there's a need to avoid any sort of manual data migration. As the system grows, you don't want to have administrators moving data from one server to another. Um, and in the end, you need some sort of painless scaling so you can start out with, you know, four racks of storage and add an additional rack when um, there's additional data requirements. Uh, maybe as time goes by, you're taking an older rack and you take it offline. All of these things need to happen in a very um, automated, um, simple, easy to administer fashion. And finally, um, cost is, of course, uh, an important function. Um, particularly for these large systems, you want the overall cost of the store system to be ideally a linear function of the size and performance of the system. You don't want to pay four times as much to get twice as much storage capacity. You want to actually have that be uh, a linear function instead. Um, you also don't want to have a situation where you have sort of a forklift upgrade where you bought, you know, a system of size X and you reach its total capacity. And in order to get sort of something that's larger, you have to buy sort of the next generational model and you throw out the old one and migrate everything to the new one. Those sorts of um, approaches to these systems um, that we are very accustomed to in the last decades um, simply don't work when you start talking about cloud scale applications. Um, similarly, you want to avoid any sort of vendor lock-in. If you bought a petabyte of storage from one vendor, you don't want to be forced to use that same vendor for the next petabyte. You want to be able to make hopefully a better choice um, so you don't have to repeat your old mistakes. And all of these sort of factors point to having um, a system where you have a choice of the hardware you deploy in and you have a choice of the software. And that software should be open source so that you have you know, access to multiple vendors for support so you can um, fix your bugs, um, run any hardware, all of those important things. I mean, I'm sort of taking all the lessons that um, um, Google and Amazon have sort of driven home and applying them to your, your own organization. Um, so what is Ceph? Um, it's a number of things. So Ceph is a unified storage system. And we say unified in that it, it is a, a, a single storage platform that provides multiple interfaces that allow you to store your data. So um, there are multiple object APIs. There's a, a native API called the Breda that lets you sort of access all the low-level capabilities of the distributed object storage infrastructure that that provides. There's also a, a RESTful interface that um, is a bit higher level and is designed to be compatible with Amazon S3 and OpenStack Swift um, using sort of standard protocols, HTTP, RESTful API. Um, so you can use either of those if you need objects. Um, Ceph also provides a block interface. Um, so I think virtual disk or what you would get out of a SAN, essentially. Um, that provides advanced features like then provisioning snapshots and the ability to clone images, um, copy and write cloning. Um, and finally, Ceph provides a file system API. So you get files and directories, objects, um, distributed metadata architecture, strong consistency, and, and important features like snapshots. Um, Ceph is also a distributed source system, um, and what we mean by distributed is that it's designed to scale to an entire data center, so anywhere from tens of servers to tens of thousands of servers, um, terabytes to exabytes. Um, it's also distributed in the sense that it's designed from the ground up to be fault tolerant, so there's no single point of failure, no single server uh, failure in the system can, take, can compromise overall availability of your data. And it's also similarly designed to run on commodity hardware, so instead of having to invest in very extensive hardware components, um, you can use sort of commercial office self um, components and build a highly reliable system out of much less reliable individual parts. Um, and as part of this um, process of making it distributed and scalable and so forth is, of course, making it self-managing and self-healing so you don't have to have an army of system administrators that are, that are sort of dealing with the nitty-gritty of, you know, removing failed disks and so forth. So... The sort of overarching architectural goal of Ceph is design a storage system that that is really going to scale to you know tens of thousands of servers. Um, so how do you how do you how do you approach this problem? Um, sort of at a very high level, you have this basic problem where you have some human um, or application or perhaps some human cyborg who is trying to access some data that is stored on some number of disks. Um, you have lots of disks because you have lots of data, and you know because we are computer scientists and computer users, we typically put a computer in the middle to sort of um, Bridge that gap between the human and the and the you know, spitting rust that's actually actually storing your bits. Now the re real picture looks something like this because you have lots of people who are trying to access this large amount of data, um, or in reality you actually have something that looks much more like this where you have many 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 users trying to access data. And clearly in these sorts of architectures, the computer that's sort of the server that's um, acting as a middleman um, becomes a scalability bottleneck. And so what we really want is an architecture that um, what we say. We say scales out, so 
you're actually talking to lots of different computers, each storing some data, and you somehow know which one of those to talk to. And as you need, as you scale out more disk and you have more people accessing that data, you can sort of scale the system horizontally. Um, so that's tricky. <laughs> so the way that we, we, we do that in Ceph is we create a distributed object storage layer called Redis, and that's this red component that you see along the bottom. So this is a highly reliable, um, self-managing distributed object storage um, cluster um, that is comprised of intelligent storage nodes. So think um, anywhere from tens to thousands of computers with, with locally attached disks that are talking together on the network that are providing this sort of basic object storage um, infrastructure that, that can scale out and is highly available and reliable and so forth. Um, and, and then on top of this object interface, we create um, a number of different sort of higher level storage services that are consumed by various types of users and applications. So there's the Libratus component, which is the, the bluish green bit. Um, this is a low level object storage library that you can link into your web 2.0 application if you're you know, building the next Flickr clone, that type of deal. Um, there's the Rados Gateway, which is built on top of that, but which gives you um, Amazon S3 and OpenStack Swift compatible RESTful API access if you want to you know, take an existing Amazon application and port it to a different provider, or if you want to move out of Amazon's infrastructure, any of those sorts of scenarios. There is a block device called RBD that gives you a virtual disk abstraction that is then, again, stored in, in that sort of underlying object um, storage cluster. And then there's also a Ceph distributed file system that gives you files and directories in a POSIX compliant distributed file system API. Um, and that's supported by both Linux kernel um, for a couple of years now, or you can do it in user space using Fuse or um, a low level library that you can link directly into your application. So one question is, um, why do we start with an object storage system and build all these services on top of that? Why not have some other sort of low-level primitive that we're distributing across lots of servers? And there are two reasons for that. First is that objects are more useful than talking about the individual disks themselves or the blocks on the disks. So in contrast to a disk, which is just sort of a huge array of these fixed size, you know, 512 type blocks and are very sort of awkward to work with, um, objects have names. You can call them, you know, foobar, whatever you want. Objects can be any size, so they can be, you know, 512 bytes, they can be one byte, they can be, you know, two gigabytes. The, as far as the application is concerned, it can put whatever it wants on an object. Um, and it, using an object interface gives you a very simple API with um, reasonably rich semantics that makes it easy to sort of build um, higher level storage services on top of that, that basic interface. On the flip side, objects are more scalable than files. So. Um, some other systems will take basically an existing distributed file system that's built on top of blocks um, and then build object layers and block layers and so forth on top of that. Um, and the problem there is that files and directories with this complicated tree structure are hard to distribute. If you have you know, tens of thousands of servers, um, it's, it's non-trivial to take this tree structure and distribute it across those servers and have be able to sort of find the data that you need in an efficient and fast fashion. Um, objects, on the other hand, sort of give you this nice middle ground where you have a trivially parallelizable workload. You can hash the object name across those servers um, and it distributes and scales very well. Um, so Ceph has sort of a basic object storage model that's provided by Redis. The basic idea is that you have some number of logical pools, um, a logical collection of objects. Um, each pool is sort of an independent namespace, um, and you specify some replication level for the pool, like I want three replicas of every object in that pool. Um, and you specify some placement policy, like these, these, this pool is distributed across this set of devices or whatever. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then inside each pool, you have a huge number of objects. I mean, you know, well, it could be one object, it could be you know, 10 trillion, doesn't really matter. And then each of those objects is just sort of a logical unit of data. It can contain a bunch of bytes, um, anywhere from bytes to gigabytes. It can contain some number of attributes, um, simple sort of key value pairs describing something about that object. Um, and you can also store keys and values in an object, um, sort of like a like a small Berkeley DB file or sort of a NoSQL database, um, which is sort of a very powerful interface to build higher level services on top of. I and mean, you can do any and all of these things in these stuff objects. So they're very, very versatile and flexible in that sense. Um, so then when you're putting together the storage cluster, um, your system looks something like this. So you have some number of disks um, in a server. Um, on top of each of those disks, you have a local file system. 
um, because we don't want to deal with the details of all that block allocation and so forth. And that, that, that problem has been solved, you know, many times. Um, so we sort of reuse that technology. Um, you can run on top of ButterFS, um, which is sort of a new next generation Linux file system that is very promising. Um, although, depending on who you ask, not quite ready for production just yet. Um, there's XFS, which is what um, most people actually are using today. And of course, X4 is sort of one of the more common choices. Um, and so then on top of that local file system, there is the Ceph object storage daemon, this OSD. Um, and that's sort of the intelligent bit of code, a Ceph code that's running um, in front of each disk um, on each server that is managing um, client access to that data and then also communicating with other OSDs in the cluster to have some sort of um, distributed behavior. And all of that usually is in, in a single server. Usually people put, you know, anywhere from four to 12 disks in the machine, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, and then you have lots and lots of these servers in your data center that are comprising your cluster. Um, so lots of these little blue boxes. Um, there are also a small number of sort of uh, leader nodes, or we call them monitors, um, that are responsible for, for sort of coordinating access to all this data. So typically in a cluster, you have two types of servers. Um, you have lots of these object storage daemons. Um, you know, they have an SSD or a RAID group or a RAID or whatever. And stuff can run on pretty much any type of hardware. So we're relatively agnostic about whether it's flash or, or spinning disk. It just depends on what your performance requirements are. Um, and these demons are intelligently talking to each other to sort of have sort of emergent cluster behavior. Um, and then you have a very small number of these monitors, usually three or five in a cluster. Um, and they're sort of responsible for maintaining key cluster membership and state, you know, who is, which nodes are participating in the cluster, who's allowed to authenticate, um, what the current state of the machines are, whether they're up or down, um, that sort of thing. So these, these guys are not in the data path at all. They're just sort of, you know, making sure there's some, everything doesn't descend into chaos, as it were. Um, and then from the human slash cyborg user's perspective, application's perspective, it can treat the entire storage cluster as sort of a logical storage pool. It doesn't really need to be worried about the details of where its data is going. It just uh, says, I want to store object foo in this pool, and it, you know, hands it to the client library, and it's automatically assigned and distributed to some server. Um, and so the application's perspective is just a very clean, logical abstraction. You have pools of objects, and you have objects, and then you can store lots and lots of them, and they're highly available and reliable and so forth. So one of the, the key challenges in the system is how do you decide where your data is going to go, you know? Um, and we have a few basic requirements. Um, first is that all objects should be replicated um, n times. Usually n is two or three. You can change it to whatever you want, anywhere from one to ten, I think, are the limits. Um, and you also want those objects to be distributed across the cluster in some automatic um, way that is balanced and, and distributed. And it also changes as the, the cluster changes over time. Because remember, you're adding nodes as your data needs to expand, and you might be, nodes might be failing. You might be removing old nodes that have older, crappy hardware that's, that's not as reliable and so forth. So we need, we need to have this sort of dynamic distribution of data across the system. Um, we also want to consider the physical infrastructure. Um, so in a typical deployment, you have you know, some number of these Ceph OSD storage demons running on a host. You have, you know, lots of these hosts in a rack. You have lots of racks in a row. Maybe you have multiple rows in your data center. Maybe you have multiple data centers. Um, and when you're deciding where to place your data, you want to consider that infrastructure um, in your placement policy. So, for example, you might want to say, I have three replicas of every piece of data, every object, um, but I want those objects to be stored in different racks so that a... Um, a power failure or a top of rack switch failure won't take out more than one replica, so I can have sort of continuous availability in the face of those types of failures. It might be that I want to have, you know, data center redundancy, so I want to replicate across data centers, um, or maybe I want to replicate across rows, or maybe I want to constrain all replicas to the same row, that sort of thing. Um, so we'd like to be able to sort of do all of those, all of those different things. Um, so the challenge is how do you, you know, how do you accomplish this distribution of data? And there, from a very high level, there are sort of three basic approaches you can take. Um, the simplest is that, you know, I, as the person who's storing this data, choose a server to store it on, and I store it on that data, and then when I come back later and I want to read it again, I have to remember where I put it. Um, that's problematic because the, the cluster state is dynamic. You know, maybe this server I stored it on has since failed or um, the data has since moved around, and so I don't know where to find the data. So that's not really a workable solution in, a, in any system of scale. Um, a more common solution is to, you know, choose a server to store it on and then to have some index that keeps track of where it was stored. So when I need to find my data later, I first do a lookup that says where is object foo, and some name service tells me which server it's on, and then I go talk to that server. Um, that works, and that's what uh, most sort of traditional architectures um, do, but it's 
it's not ideal because you have to maintain this huge index of where everything goes. Um, that in, in and of itself can be a scalability problem. Um, and it also means there's a sort of separate lookup step before I can get to my data, which is which is slow. Um, so newer distributed systems, the sort of a new generation of cloud scale um, applications use um, a hash function or a, a functional placement. So the basic idea is that you take the, the name of the object and the state of the cluster, the number of nodes I have, and I do some calculation, and that tells me where the data should go. Um, and that's what that's what that does. So we use an algorithm called Crush. It's a pseudo-random placement algorithm, which means instead of um, looking up where your data is stored, you do a, this fast calculation. Um, it's a repeatable deterministic calculation, so if I have the same inputs, the same name of the object, and the same state of the cluster, I'm always going to get the same answer. So it's sort of reliable. I don't have to store where the data is going. I just goes. I just have to recalculate its location. I'll get the same answer later. Um, it generates a statistically uniform distribution, which means it's basically data is evenly distributed across all nodes in the system, so there, there's balanced utilization. Um, but there are a couple of key properties that make Crush suitable for, for storage in particular. Um, one is that Crush provides a stable mapping, which means that you know, if I place a million objects into my system across 100 nodes and I say add one more node, so I have 101 now, um, roughly 1% of the existing data is going to migrate to that new node. Um, but most of the data is going to stay where it is. So it's important, particularly for data storage, where it's very expensive to move data around, that you have this stability in where, where stuff goes regardless of, you know, when things are changing. And the second thing that Crush does is allow you to create a rule-based configuration. So you can, you essentially describe, describe to Crush the, the hierarchy of your, your physical infrastructure, um, you know, hosts, racks, rows, data centers, you know, however you sort of um, want to define it. Um, and then you specify a rule or policy about how you want to distribute your data across that hierarchy. So typical examples would be, you know, three replicas, separated across racks, or maybe three replicas across, separated across racks, but in the same row, so I can limit my replication bandwidth. Um, or maybe I want one replica coming from one row, which is, you know, my SAS sort of frontline SAS disk or SSDs or something, and the additional two replicas in a different row with slower disks. Um, all of those things are very pos are possible with Crush because it has a sort of flexible rule specification language that lets you, lets you do that. And sort of the end result is that you have this sort of highly flexible and sophisticated ability to describe where your data goes. But at the same time, you get the benefits of having it be a hash function that lets you calculate where the location goes only when you need to know that information, and you never have to store, you know, where the data goes in the end. So this is one of the, the key things that makes the, the overall system scale very well. So sort of a picture of what this looks like. Um, what you typically have is a, a large number of objects in the pool. Um, you hash the name of the object across this internal abstraction we call a placement group. It's sort of a, sh a shard, essentially. Um, so all these buckets are sort of binned into, all the, all the objects in the pool are binned into these buckets or placement groups. Um, and then we use Crush to decide where those placement groups are stored. So for any given placement group, any sort of subset of those objects, they're stored, going to be stored on N servers, and Crush is going to give you which N devices um, we're going to put, that, put those pieces of data on. I and mean, when you do this for the entire cluster, you hash all the placement groups and you distribute them across all nodes, you get this sort of um, statistically uniform distribution, everything sort of randomly spread around across all nodes. Um, and so any given node is going to be storing, you know, maybe 100 different placement groups and all the objects that, that those groups contain. And then when the client comes along and it needs to, you know, read a particular object, it takes a copy of that crush function um, and the, the state of the the state of the cluster, it calculates where that data should go, and Crush tells it where that data is stored, and then it can go and talk to those nodes directly. So there's no lookup step. It can sort of, you know, if you have a cluster of 10,000 nodes, the client can, you know, in a couple microseconds know exactly which node it needs to talk to and send a message directly to that system um, to read or write that piece of data. So one of the interesting things that happens is what, what does the system do if there is a failure or there's a, some change in topology? So in this example, consider if one node fails. Um, because all of the other nodes in the system are intelligent, they're running the, the Ceph OSD software that does all kinds of crazy things, it actually, those other nodes will find out that, that that one node has failed. They'll look at the data they're storing and they'll say, oh, I have a piece of data placement group that was replicated on the failed node. Um, I should do something about that. And in a completely distributed peer-to-peer -peer fashion, they will decide to migrate that data to the new location as, as specified by the, that crush mapping. 
and they'll coordinate that data migration and make sure it happens in a totally seamless and consistent way so that from the client's perspective, who's trying to read or write data, they have the illusion of single copy semantics. They don't have to worry about having, you know, weird face conditions or anything. So from their perspective, everything is continuously available. Everything is just fine. But in a fully distributed fashion, the clusters are moving data around in response to this failure, um, and the, the clients are none the wiser. Um, and so then later, some time later, the client comes and also wants to read that object again that happens to be in that placement group. It'll recalculate, you know, the crush mapping. It has new state for the cluster because it now knows that node has failed, and it'll find the data in a new location, and everything everything is hunky-dory. It all just works. So that sort of is a high-level view of how the that underlying object storage infrastructure that underpins SAS works. So that's, the, that's that red component there on the bottom, the distributed object store that everything else is based on. It gives you high availability, um, reliability, data durability, um, self-healing and self-management, um, all kinds of good stuff. So then on top of this object abstraction, we build, a, we build a number of different types of services. So again, Libreados is sort of the, the, the low-level library that lets you access all those capabilities. It's just uh, a low-level set of bindings that lets you read and write objects, essentially. Um, you can use it from C applications, you know, their bindings in Java, Python, Ruby, PHP, you know, whatever, whatever you're writing your application in. It's relatively easy to consume. And the basic idea here is you have some application, you know, say it's, you know, Flickr 2.0 or whatever. Um, it's using Libratus. Um, it sort of speaks a low-level, efficient protocol based on, you know, uses TCP and Ethernet networking and so forth. Um, that lets it access directly the storage cluster on the back end. So highly parallel direct access to all these, you know, 10,000 storage nodes comprising your, your storage cluster to read and write objects. Um, so again, multiple language bindings, direct access, um, a very efficient protocol. Um, one of the exciting things about Rados is it's actually a very rich API. So um, the basic concept of having data objects as a unit of data and distributing them across the cluster and so forth, um, that's, that, that distributes very well. But that doesn't prevent us from actually making the things that you're allowed to do with a single object very rich. So Rados gives you a number of nice things like um, atomic single object transactions. So I can send an operation to the cluster for a single object that will, you know, modify some data and change an attribute, for example, or do an atomic compare and swap. Um, and all that will uh, atomically apply to, to that object and be replicated safely and so forth across the system. Um, you can also sort keys and values inside an object. So instead of just storing bytes like you would in a disk block, you can store, um, you know, what you would store in a NoSQL database. So uh, sorted key value interface, you can do efficient queries, range queries, and so forth, efficient insertions and deletions, all the good stuff. Um, there's also some low-level primitives that are designed to support snapshots. So other parts of the system, like the, the Redis block device and the file system, let you snapshot sort of arbitrary pieces of the hierarchy. Um, that's all based upon support and Libratus for essentially allowing snapshots on any individual object to be different from another object, which is, which is very powerful. Um, one of the most exciting things is you can embed code in the object store um, that actually um, can implement new functionality. So, for example, um, I keep coming back to this example. You're, you know, you're building the next Flickr. It's going to be um, the next Instagram, whatever. Um, and you're storing lots and lots of images in your cluster. Maybe after users upload images, you want to go through and you want to filter out the red eye or you want to generate thumbnails and, and so forth. So usually that process means reading a bunch of data out of the system, processing it, and writing it back in again. Um, with Rados, you can embed code into the object store using a, a plug-in interface that would do that image manipulation internal to the storage node. So then the application would simply, you know, send a request to the storage system that says, you know, filter red eye out of object X. And that computation would happen on the storage node without any sort of network copying or overhead. And then do an atomic save mutation and then save it out again. Um, which is very powerful both for things like image manipulation, for, you know, data analytics, um, you name it, you know, whatever whatever type of data you're storing in an object, you can sort of embed the code that does low-level manipulations on that data into the system. Um, and the final thing is that you can use Rados as sort of an inter-client inter communication um, mechanism, um, similar to the way that Apache Zookeeper is used um, in many systems. Um, you know, the Rados gateway uses it for cache coherency, for managing its distributed cache stuff. Uh, the Rados block device uses it, uses it for notifying clients about snapshot events, things like that, resizes 
um, there, a, a wide range of applications there. Um, so on top of Libratus, there are a couple of services that we that we built and that we deliver. So one of those is the Rados Gateway. This is a RESTful um, object storage gateway. So in contrast to Libratus, which sort of gives you these low-level um, object bindings that are sort of specific to Ceph and all of these bells and whistles, um, Rados Gateway, in contrast, gives you something that is um, compatible with Amazon S3 or OpenStack Swift. So it's designed sort of for um, public-facing Internet applications, um, you know, you want to be an ISP that can be with Amazon S3, or you want to move your large application out of Amazon's infrastructure into your own data center, um, then Rados Gateway is your ticket. And the basic idea here is that you have um, some number of Rados Gateway daemons. Um, These are essentially proxies that on the front side are speaking a RESTful interface. Uh, maybe you have a load balancer in front. Um, in fact, probably you do. Um, and so it's RESTful interface up the front. It's an aqua based security model. And on the back end, they're using Libratus and talking directly to the object store. I mean, you can scale these horizontally. You can add as many gateways as you want, depending on, on what your requirements are. Um, so the, the Rados Gateway API supports buckets and accounting, so the features of the Amazon and, and Swift APIs, um, things that aren't present sort of in the low-level Rados um, APIs. Um, it includes all sorts of infrastructure for doing usage-based accounting and integration with the billing system, so you can find out, you know, how much, how many object requests and how much data is stored in individual buckets and map that back to users and go charge money for it. Um, this is one of the key pieces that, for example, um, DreamHost's um, Dream Object service um, is uses to sort of prevent, um, to provide a Amazon S3 and Amazon, or app, uh, blah, Backspace cloud files, those type of services to, to end users over the internet. Um, the next, co next component is the Rados block device. Um, so this is a virtual disk abstraction, um, essentially what you'd get out of a SAN, um, a block device, network block device um, that can be prevented, presented either to a virtual machine or to a regular Linux host. Um, so the basic idea here is that you have, you know, again, lots of disks to lots of servers. Um, they're storing lots of objects. You take, you take sort of this virtual disk and you stripe it across those objects and you store it in the cluster, and you present that virtual disk to the, to the computer machine that's using it. Uh, more commonly, it's actually virtual machines. Um, most people are using Redis block device for, for their cloud, public and private cloud infrastructure with things like OpenStack and CloudStack. Um, so the basic idea here is that Libratus is providing access to all these objects. LibRBD is taking lots of objects and sort of assimilating them into a sort of a virtual disk abstraction that's being presented to the virtualization container like um, KVM. Um, and then as far as the virtual machine is concerned, it just sees a disk. It doesn't know that it's actually stored in the cloud or in your sort of private cloud infrastructure. Um, and this gives you this gives you a functionality um, equivalent essentially to what you get in Amazon for um, EBS. Um, because it's a shared storage infrastructure, you can do some cute things like do live migration of a running virtual machine from one host to another. So if you had your, your cloud infrastructure and all the virtual machines are using RBD for storage and you have a host that you need to bring down for maintenance, you can migrate all the live migrate all the vir running virtual machines off that host, shut it down, reboot your upgrades, and then migrate them back. Or you can balance load or do all of the things that, that you need to do to sort of keep your infrastructure, infrastructure running well. Um, there's also a driver in the mainline Linux kernel that's been there for two years now that lets you map a Redis block device image, a virtual disk, as a regular device node, so dev rbd0. And once it's there, you can do anything you can normally do with a disk in Linux. So you can put a file system on it, you can re-export it via iSCSI, you can, I don't know, format it on a virtual machine and feed it directly, point it directly at that block device. Um, very flexible in having that sort of native support. Um, available in any modern Linux distribution. Um, so Redis Block Device provides another, a number of sort of key features. Um, so you're storing disk images. You can decouple the virtual machine from the host um, because the virtual machine is sort of stored in this shared storage um, backend. Um, individual disk images are striped across the entire cluster, so they're broken into objects that are then randomly distributed. That means that if you have one very large or very busy virtual disk, um, that load from that disk is distributed across many servers. Um, this sort of equalizes load across the cluster and makes you not have to worry about hotspots so much. Uh, the Redis block device provides snapshots, so for any given image you can create read-only snapshots while the machine is running, and you can roll back to those snapshots, you can copy data out, all those things. 
Um, there's also a copy on write cloning feature, so you can take an existing image, an existing read-only image, like a you know a base operating system install of you know Ubuntu 1204 or CentOS 63, whatever it is, and then you can create a and sort of instantly um, create a clone of that image for each virtual machine and immediately start reading and writing from that image. Um, and then as as those clones are written to, then the copy and write mechanism kicks in and it efficiently deals with all that. Um, so Redis block device is supported in um, Kimu KVM. Um, so most sort of new clouds tend to be using KVM hypervisor. It, it's integrated directly with the lib, the lib RBD library, so you don't have any special kernel support. You just run KVM and libRBD, and it'll it'll talk directly to the storage backend. There's also support in the mainline Linux kernel, um, and there's integration with um, OpenStack and CloudStack both. So uh, particularly with OpenStack, the support is a little bit more mature, um, but there's a lot of work going on in the CloudStack world. Um, and with Zen, the Zen hypervisor as well, um, there's work going on to make Zen also use libRBD so that you get sort of this um, efficient usage of the, the RPG block devices. Um, so for the cloning, the basic idea is that you have, you know, some operating system image um, that consumes a lot of space and you want to instantly be able to create copies for each virtual machine so that each VM that you instantiate can immediately start booting and not actually consume any additional space is the first thing. Um, and then as you as you write into those clones, you know, those blocks get the copy and write triggers that actually fills in those blocks and they have sort of different data than what the, the base operating system has. Um, but then if you read from parts of the image that haven't been rewritten, then, um, then it'll, the reads will either read the newly updated data or they'll fall through to the, the base image parent. Um, so that's, that's the block device. Um, and the last piece, um, sort of the most architecturally exciting piece, but also the most complicated, is the Ceph distributed file system. Um, and this is a full-blown POSIX distributed file system that's built on top of um, the Redis distributed object store. Um, so the basic idea here is that if you have client, some client that is accessing the file system, you know, it has a regular map point, it wants to see files and directories, um, it will communicate with a new set of servers called metadata servers um, to traverse that file system namespace, to, to read directories, to do LS and um, CD and to pass and so forth. Um, but then when it comes time to actually read and write file data, when it actually wants to read some data out of the file or write data to a file, um, it can talk directly to the object storage nodes to and communicate with the object that actually stores that data. Um, so in contrast to architectures um, or systems based on protocols like NFS, where all data and metadata access like this funnel through a single server, um, in Ceph, um, that access is distributed. So um, Ceph has multiple metadata servers, so those are in a bottleneck. You can scale from one to 100 or however many metadata servers. And then when you actually are reading and writing file data, that's distributed across all object storage devices. Um, so, you know, imagine a supercomputer with a million processors that are all opening files in the file system and writing data at the same time. Um, this is the architecture. This architecture is designed to support that type of use case. So these metadata servers are responsible for managing the POSIX shared file system. So they handle the directory hierarchy, all the file metadata, you know, size and ownership and timestamps and so forth. They actually store all of that metadata in Rados itself because we, we already have this highly reliable, highly available, durable um, storage abstraction. So we might as well store all the metadata in there too. So these metadata servers are really just sort of big in-memory caches that are doing this, all the complicated synchronization between each other and with the client to make sure that you're following all the rules about you know, how file systems are supposed to behave. Um, and the other thing to point out is that these metadata servers are only required if you're using the file system. So most deployments, that's, <coughs> excuse me, most deployments of Ceph today are using um, the Redis block device or the optic interfaces. Um, and so in those deployments, you don't actually need these metadata servers at all. Um, so the, the challenge here is that for a file system, you have a complicated tree structure. You have all these files and directories, and you have some number of metadata servers, and it's sort of non, not obvious how you should distribute that work across multiple servers. And so what Ceph does, is what we call dynamic subtree partitioning. So we'll sort of look, observe the workload, see where, which parts of the file system are currently being accessed. And then as time goes by, the load balancer will automatically decide, you know, this piece of the hierarchy is, you know, busy. I have this available metadata server. I'm gonna migrate responsibility to this other server. And as you add servers to the cluster, 
And as the workload over the hierarchy changes, um, the load balancer will automatically and dynamically sort of redistribute responsibility for the workload across these different servers. And we call this dynamic subtree partitioning because we are partitioning based on subtrees and we're dynamically moving them around between systems. Um, so there are a number of key features um, that are, are good about this approach. First, there's no sort of manual load, by load migration or anything. The administrator doesn't have to worry about all this. It happens automatically. A second is it's a subtree partition, which is uh, much more efficient because of the, the importance of um, data locality and metadata workloads. Um, and the other is that it's um, sort of arbitrarily scalable. So if you have a large tree, you can carve it into a, a small number of very large chunks if you have a small number of servers, or a much larger number of smaller chunks if you have more servers. Uh, so you can add more servers as you need more capacity. You can remove them if, if the workload is light. And the system can sort of dynamically adapt to that scenario. Um, the file system has a number of other sort of um, unique features that aren't available in other systems. One of those is that um, Seth keeps track of recursive directory statistics, um, the most interesting usually being the file size. Um, so normally when you do an ls-al in a directory, the file size you see next to a directory is some sort of focus number. It's usually a multiple of 4K. It doesn't really tell you anything. In contrast, in Seth, the size that you see on a directory is actually the sum of all files stored in that subdirectory in the system. Um, so it's the same information you would get from the du command where you want to you know, do a, a, this expensive scan to find out how much data is stored there, except that it's all maintained sort of in real time for free, and you get it every time you do an ls, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. There are a few other um, pieces of information, too. Um, there's also keeping track of the number of files stored in the system and the most recent modification time. And those pieces of information are available if you look at the um, extended attributes available in any directory. You'll see these sort of virtual synthetic attributes show up that give you access to those, those statistics. Um, another unique feature of Ceph is the ability to snapshot arbitrary directories in the system. And one of the challenges with building a petabyte scale file system is that you're typically storing lots of different types of data and you have different data retention policies for that, for that information. Um, and so what SEP allows you to do is sort of create, um, instead of having to carve it into subvolumes and so forth, SEP lets you take a snapshot of any directory in the system um, using no tools. So there's a hidden .snap directory. If you do a make dir in that directory, you can create a snapshot, read it there. Um, you can traverse into it um, and view files and copy files out and all that stuff um, using, you know, normal a normal directory map. And then when you're done with it, you can just do an arm during that directory and the snapshot is deleted. So that makes it very easy to use, no special tools, and very powerful. Um, the file system has a number of different ways you can access it. So there, as I mentioned before, there's um, support in the Linux kernel. It's been there for about three years now. That lets you do a native set mount on a new modern Linux system. Um, and then once you mount it, you can, of course, re-export it via NFS and SIFS um, using standard tools. Although NFS re-exports a little bit, um, a little bit to, desired, to be desired right now, but we're working on that. Um, there's also a Fuse file system client called Cessfuse. Um, so if you have a, an old kernel, for example, you can use the Fuse version, or if you simply you know, don't have root access on the system, for example. Um, there's also a shared library called libsfff that you can link directly into your application to access the file system from user space. Um, <clears throat> and that's used in a number of different ways. So um, there are patches for Samba, for example, that glue libsfffs directly into its internal abstraction, so you can run a Samba server that's re-exporting Ceph as SIFs um, without having a kernel mount. Um, there's a similar project with Ganesha doing the same thing for NFS. Um, and there's also um, prototype integration for um, linking Ceph file system into Hadoop. So you can run Hadoop across a Ceph file system instead of HDFS, and you have all the same features about you know, making sure the computation runs local to the data and, and so forth and essentially making set the drop-in replacement for HDFS. The main difference being that while well, HDFS is sort of this pseudo file system that you have to have weird specialized tools to get data in and out of, um, Ceph is sort of a full-blown, fully featured file system that you can just mount. Um, so you could you know, conceivably run all your analytics on your normal source system without having this sort of separate data store for analytics. Um, so a little bit about the current state of the, the project. Um, we have had a couple of stable releases. Um, the first one was Argonaut, which was released over the summer. Um, this was sort of the first Ceph 
stable release that people were deploying in production. Um, and the Rados component, the block device, and the Rados gateway were all considered stable, and people are people are running. A few people are still running that now, actually, um, in you know service providers and internal environments. Um, more recently, Bobtail was released um, this past month. Um, it's sort of our second our second main release. It has a couple of um, big new features. One is RBD cloning and the integration of all those all that functionality into OpenStack. Um, lots and lots of improvements in performance and scaling and failed behavior. Lots of things that we learned from, you know, actually deploying on large clusters and fixing all the sort of corner cases you don't always think about beforehand. Um, Raiders Gateway has much better API compatibility with Amazon S3 and Swift and performance improvements and so forth. Um, and that was just, just released um, this past month. Um, Cuttlefish is going to be our next release um, sometime this spring. Um, the things we're focusing on are Improved integration for the Redis block device, so things like working with Zen, um, having a nice SCSI support gateway. Um, for Redis gateway, we're working on multi-site federation disaster recovery. So similar to sort of Amazon S3, where you can have different regions, um, have buckets of different regions, um, where we're doing the same thing in Redis gateway, so you have multiple data centers. And then additionally, having the ability to replicate across the data centers automatically for disaster recovery. Um, so that's coming soon. On the Redis side. Um, we're working on things like improved data inte integrity checking, um, ongoing performance improvements, those sorts of things. And there's file, ongoing file system works, um, file system work to improve, um, you know, robust failure recovery and stability, and um, working on important things like FS check in that world. Um, so this is my contact information. Um, you can follow me on Twitter um, or email me if, if you so desire. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Danielle, who I believe has a few questions. Great. Um, Sage, would you like to answer some of the questions that were asked throughout the presentation at this time? Oh, yes, yes. I forgot. Um, okay. And if anybody so has qu questions would like to ask, there is a question button that's on top of the, the um, slide panel, and you can just submit your question through there. Okay. Um, okay, so the first question is, is it possible to use the Liberatus API while CephFS is in use? And the answer is yes. So um, the goal of having Ceph being this sort of unified source platform is that you have the single underlying storage infrastructure, the actual storage nodes running OSDs, storing all these objects, and you can use all of the interfaces to access that storage at the same time or, you know, one at a time, you know, depending on how you deploy it. So. Um, Typically what happens is people come in with one use case in mind. They want to use, you know, the Redis block device for, um, you know, their cloud virtual machine storage, and then they realize they already have all this storage infrastructure. They also want to store objects. They want an S3 compatible interface, and then they also set up the gateway, and then they don't have to sort of duplicate different storage systems for all the different use cases that they have in mind. So that's sort of one of the key key values of running, running Ceph in these types of environments. Um, the next, next question. Um, is it possible to – sorry, it just, it just scrolls because there was a new question. Is it possible to change the, the crush rules while the system is online? What will happen? Um, the answer is yes. So the system is is um, robust in the sense that any time the description of where data should be stored changes, um, the system will respond to migrate data to sort of realize that new distribution. So usually that happens because you – um, a, a node fails, and so the description changes very slightly. Data should move a little bit, uh, or a small amount of data should move in order to recover from that failure, and the system sort of automatically does that. Um, but it could be something else. It could be that the administrator says, well, this rack, I want to pick up lines. I'm just going to mark it out, and all the data in that rack should migrate somewhere else. And that's a, that's a drastic change, but the system responds in exactly the same way. It just says, this is where the data is now. This is where it's supposed to be. I'm going to migrate the data to where it should be. Um, so yes, you can change the crush rules online. You just have to be careful because sometimes that data movement is expensive and it'll just will be slower while that while that is happening. Um, the next question: Are there plans to have geo-aware replication? And the answer is yes. So for for the short term, we're working on adding um, geo replication in the Redis Gateway interface specifically for the Amazon S3 and um, Open sex with compatible object storage systems um, because that's sort of the, the easiest place to add it, and that's actual also where the most demand is. Um, and then, we'll, looking a little bit further out, we'll be adding it um, at sort of another price of the systems for you know having 
disaster recovery capabilities for block devices, for example, um, or for or for, or for the file system. Um, let's see. How about this one? Um, what is the suggested OSD size in SES? Um, does it make more sense to build more smaller size OSDs or less larger OSDs to reach maximum performance? Is LVM for OSD supported a supported configuration? Um, it, <laughs> the short answer is it depends. Um, but what most people do is they run a single OSD per disk. So usually they're building their clusters out of SATA disks or SAS disks. They're usually one, two, three terabytes, something like that. And they run a, a storage, an OSD for each of those. Um, and that's the, that's the simplest configuration. You don't have to worry about um, doing any RAID or volume management or anything like that. You can run the storage demons on top of a RAID array. Um, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. It's typically more work um, and doesn't really buy you a whole lot. Um, but there, there, there are trade-offs that, um, that you might want to consider. Um, as far as what kind of hardware people are using, um, the, the, what most people tend to be doing um, are nodes that have between 4 and 12 disks per host because um, that has, um, gives you a fair bit of CPU with those disks. Um, we've done experiments doing performance tests on much larger nodes that have, you know, 36 or 40 disks. They have all these new high-density um, chassis that you can get from various vendors. Um, and that works okay. The, the problem right now is that we're, um, in our performance tests, when we're tr sort of trying to maximize throughput, we've run into problems with um, the CPU architectures with uh, non-uniform memory access and so forth, just trying to move that much data within the system, within the, system, within the host um, can be problematic. So um, depending on your workload, maybe it'll, maybe it'll work because you're doing small IOs or something, um, but for sort of streaming workloads, then, then you need a little bit more CPU. Um, I guess the one thing I should mention here is that sort of the, the recommended sort of best configuration usually combines um, both a, a disk, um, a spinning disk, and an SSD for each OSD. So you use the SSD for journaling and the disk for data storage. Um, or you can even use a single SSD and share it among multiple um, OSDs. So, and maybe you have, you know, a 12 disk host that has one or two SSDs for journals. And that, that seems to be a pretty good configuration that, that people, that people do. Um, let's see. Are there any big clusters in production besides DreamHost? Uh, yes. Um, I think DreamHost has the largest currently, um, but there are people currently, you know, purchasing provisioning hardware for set clusters that are going to be much larger, so, you know, 10 petabytes or more. Um, but there are but there are several large clusters that are um, nearly as large as DreamHost, or like in the three petabyte range, four petabyte range, somewhere in there. Um, so, yes. And there are multiple, you know, service providers with sort of public cloud products or whatever that are, that are using set per day in production. Um, Let's see. Uh, is is Ceph using erasure coding approach to save objects? Um, the answer is no. Currently, Ceph uses just straight object replication. So um, every your your bytes are actually stored, you know, n times on n different hosts. Um, it's much simpler. Um, it tends to be much faster for all but a small set of workloads. Um, and it's hard enough to get that right <laughs> that we weren't, don't want to overly complicate the system. Um, part of the problem is that the the, CES, the object um, interface at the in the low level of Rados lets you do all kinds of stuff that would be very hard to do with erasure coding. So having you know atomic transactions and you know, key value objects and all that stuff um, would be very difficult to do um, if you're using you have parity math sort of mixing in and your data sort of spread around. Um, let's see, this one. Um, will there be Zen live migration for virtual machines specifically for OpenStack or CloudStack? I know it's available for KVM, but it's just wondering for Zen. Um, so yes, right now, KVM is the only virtual machine hypervisor that directly supports um, LibRBD. Um, luckily, that's what a lot of people like to use, but there also is a big user base for Zen. Um, and so there's work in progress right now um, in the Zen community to integrate Zen's block interface called BlockTap3, I believe, um, with LibRBD so that you have equivalent functionality there uh, as well. Um, so, so that's coming soon. That isn't to say that you can't use Zen with RBD today because you can always map a Linux block device um, using the regular kernel interface and then point the Zen hypervisor at that. And that'll work just as well as it would with any other 
block device, whether it's a disk or a iSCSI or whatever. Um, and you can you could do live migration in those cases too. It's just more work to sort of coordinate it and, and so forth. Um, as far as live migration support in the actual cloud stacks, open stack and cloud stack, I think actually neither of them have live migration support in them right now. I might I might be wrong because I'm not I'm not the expert um, on open stack or cloud stack, but I'm not sure that either of them actually natively support live migration yet. Um, but RVD does and KVM does. So um, you know we do a demo. Um, Occasionally, where we're using just libvirt and, and vert manager and KVM and, and the barbie D, and we do a live migration between hosts. And so it all works. It's just a matter of getting sort of that functionality into the cloud stacks, which I think haven't really prioritized it because not everybody wants it, and also because um, not very many storage systems let you do it anyway. Um, let's see. This is a good question. Is it possible to get real enterprise support, including security patches and 24-7 support? The answer is yes. That is what Ink Tank is here for. That's what we do. Um, we have an enterprise subscription product um, that includes support um, and uh, SLAs and some other sort of bells and whistles, um, but it's essentially a support product to, to help people who are running Ceph in support in their, or sorry, in production in their environment. Um, we also have a couple of other things like a, uh, a pre-production subscription. So for people who are doing um, POCs or gearing up to go into a, support, into a production but don't actually need that level of support just yet, uh, the pre-production is sort of a, a per-seat ticket-based support to sort of get everything ready to go for your environment. Um, let's see. Uh, another okay. question. Yeah, um, for one more. One more question. All right. Let's see. Uh, I have to pick a good one. <laughs> Let's see what I can find. Uh, there was one. Um, let's see. Where was it? I lost it. Sorry, okay. Is it possible to, def to define storage domains that have more or less capacity capability, SSD versus spinning disk, and define a migration scheme accordingly. Can migration be gated by APIs so that a user can select whether or not to migrate to said data? Um, yes and no. So Seth lets you define different pools of objects. And then for any given object pool, you can define what the sort of crush policy is, so how it's distributed across devices. So you can build a hybrid subcluster that has some hosts that are filled with spinning disks, some hosts that are filled with SSDs, and you can define different pools of objects that are stored on different types of storage or some combination of the two. So you could very easily um, have um, a scenario where you have, say, a public or private cloud environment. You have a different uh, pool of um, objects for RBD images that are sort of in the normal tier and one for the, the fast tier for customers who pay more, um, that sort of thing, and you can um, build the system that way. So the the next question, though, is how you can create images in either of those two pools, say, different classes of virtual machines. And then the question is, can you sort of automatically or even not automatically migrate images between them? Um, so the cloning functionality gives you the ability to sort of move images between pools and sort of asynchronously migrate all the data. Um, there are a few things that we need to do to make that a fully online process where the virtual machine is still running while that migration takes place. Um, so that isn't present yet, but is, is, is on the road map uh, coming soon. Um, and when that when that comes, there will be you know full API access, so you can sort of trigger those sorts of migrations. Um, currently, you can also do it, but you have to sort of stop the virtual machine, do a clone, and then restart it. So it's sort of a uh, not a totally seamless process, but but it will be seen. Great, thank you, Sage. Since we got so many questions and we didn't have time to answer them all, we will follow up with all questions within the next few days. Um, now I'd just like to take a few minutes to pull the audience and ask you a few questions. Um, you'll have about 30 seconds to answer each question once the question pops up. 
Great. So thank you very much. Um, as Sage has mentioned, Inktank provides professional services for both consulting and support description. Um, you can find a full detailed description on both of these services at inktank.com and at the links below. Also, make sure you check out our on-demand webinars. Um, these webinars provide practical guidance that will enable you to reduce your storage costs and get more out of your existing commodity hardware. Today's webinar will also be available um, at this link shortly. Don't hesitate to contact us with any questions at um, info at inktank.com. Um, and also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And also, one final note is I'd like you to be aware that the slides for this presentation are available under attachments along with two other documents that you will also find useful. Thank you very much for taking your, your time out today to listen to this webinar, and we hope you found it very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day.